Well, I'd like you to look here at um, Hosea, like Charles read to us, a great Hispanic prophet back in the Old Testament, Hosea. If you're here uh, first time, I, I don't always wear blue jeans. Did, did you just wake up this morning and feel nasty? You know what I'm saying? I had two dogs on the back porch, two feral cats, and a chicken. And I just said, I'm wearing blue jeans. All right. Well, Hosea chapter 1. Uh, ask you another question. How many of you woke up last night with the thunder? Yes. How many of you had two dogs jump in your bed? <laughs> we did that too. And uh, there's just something about thunder that just makes you think of, uh, you know, a great intervention of God. And with that, there was a story about a father who took his, his little boy, ate the evening meal there with the family, and he left on the plate two prunes. He just could not eat those prunes. They visually and texturally just could not pass muster on the kid eating that prune. And of course, the father told him why you want prunes, and that made it even worse, all right. <laughs> he didn't want them prunes. And so he just bowed up, said no, he was not going to eat those prunes. And the father said, okay, well, you're going to bed. If you're not going to eat your prunes, I'm not going to eat the prunes. So he let him know before he put him in bed. You know, there's God, and God is over the authority in this house, and that's me. You're under that. So you didn't just resist me. You resisted God. So you go to bed without your prunes, because God is not happy with you. God is very mad at you. Didn't eat your prunes. So he put the little kid to bed. Well, all of a sudden, the storm hit like last night. This storm came through, and the thunder was clapping, and all the father could think about was his kid that now was knowing the wrath of God because of his prunes. And so he went in there and found the little boy was kneeling by the window looking outside with the thunder coming in, clashing in like this. And he came up close to him and listened to him and he was praying. And the little fellow said, my, my, all this fuss over two little prunes. <laughs> you know, you teach your kid about the love of God and you also have to show him that God showed us love to reconcile us because of his great wrath and justice. And even though God has great wrath, that God is a good God. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So do you want to talk about God's holiness and giving his son to atone for his justice or his mercy in extending it to the whole world? You can talk about wrath, you can talk about love in the same verse. Well, that's what Hosea is about. Hosea, Isaiah, Joshua, Jesus are essentially the same word. And it means God is salvation. And you're going to see here a nation that is about to know the wrath of God because of their violation of him in idols. And yet the name of the book is God's salvation. That they will know his judgment because of the violation of the Mosaic law. But they will know God's mercy because something that is higher than the law. And that is his promise to Abraham that in your seed, Messiah, shall the nations be, remember the word? Blessed through Messiah. Israel is a Christian nation. Their hope is not Moses. Their hope is the fulfillment of circumcision, the seed of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. The Ami prophets are critical in your understanding of the Old Testament. God had sent Elijah, God had sent Elisha, God had sent Hazael of Syria to judge Israel. God was about to raise up Assyria to come down in the north in 722 BC and send him into exile. And then Babylon in 606 to 586 to the southern kingdom to bring him into exile. So you don't tempt God. He had been pushed ever since 1500 with Moses and the golden calf. And now 800 years later, God is about to come down with the promise of the Mosaic covenant that they will be sent into exile. Look, here is Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy of the Mosaic covenant. You violate me with idols. I will send you out of the land. That came true 
over, way over at the end of the Old Testament. If you were God and Israel made a golden calf of you, would you have this much material prior to your judgment of that nation? No, your Old Testament would look like cliff notes, okay? You remember those? Don't look at me like you don't know what cliff notes were. They got you through school. Your Bible would be cliff notes. And God came down the mountain, and then the Old Testament ends. And he judged them. But God now has raised up the writing prophets. Amos and Hosea in the north, A-H, M-I, Micah and Isaiah in the south. And they said, you've gone too far. And get ready. Because in 722, here come the Assyrians. 606, here come the Babylonians. My patience is done. It is time for the wrath of God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And truly in a flood of great waters, they will not reach you. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the higher tempest roll, while the tempest still is high, while that while the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high, seek God early. Don't wait till you are in jail asking for prayer. Seek Him now. Amen. You know, want to learn by precepts, not by pain. You can learn either way. And so the Ami prophets is God taking out His rod. I told you I would do this. And you have, you have walked past every ding, 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 every kind of fence I have lowered that says, do not cross here. You have crossed. And now it's time. So I'm going to give it to you, not in a speaking prophet, but he's going to write it so you can take it and roll it up in your back pocket. And when you are in Babylon, you can read it. Just like when you go to jail, they give you a Bible. Now you can read it in jail. What mama always tried to teach you. Like the great prophet Merle Haggard said. No one could steer me right. But mama tried. Welcome to Mother's Day. And so, stick with me here as we begin this Ah Me prophet. It's like, and I love the prophets because they're like Occam's razor. They trim off all the fat, they get right to it. It's not like law where you have to apply it to how history will be. It's not like the historical narrative that you try to interpret it by law. And it's not like uh, Israel's ceremony where you have to find the higher truth. The Ami prophets are when you take your kid by the chin and say, I want to look you in the eye. You ever say that? I'm going to look you in the eye. The Ami prophets are not oral medicine like the earlier prophets that go through your body then get to you. No, they're a port into your heart, right into your bloodstream. The Ami's and God speaks very clearly. And so this is God's last word to a nation about to go into exile. Uh, whenever you read it, you want it, there are five different chronological periods that will overlay it, and that's a key to reading all of the prophets. Sometimes they'll call into mind God's past promises. Then they'll look at Israel's present sin. And then they will look at future judgments. Then they'll look at a distant act of mercy through Christ who will come and die. And then it will look at ultimate glory upon his return and his reign. And so as you read, it will move between past, present, future, distant, and final. And it'll move so smooth that you'll never hear the gears. And you would expect God to be like this, that he looks down on the parade. You see it passing sequentially. God sees it from the beginning to the end. And so he will move in time and bring all things together in a synthesis. So let's watch here this one of the first of the ah me. And that's how God feels. 
Amos, Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah. Ah, me. You ever said that to your kid? Don't make me come in there again. Ah, me. Well, in verse 1, the writing prophets are over a long period. Incidentally, who was the most famous speaking prophet of this time? Give you a hint. You just finished studying him. Jonah. He writes during, or he, he prophesied during Jeroboam the second. And here you see in verse one, Hosea was during Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah in the north. He preaches and writes over a long time. Uh, they were the kings of Judah in the days of Jeroboam, meaning Jeroboam the second, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And in verse two, Hosea is going to have to experience God's heart. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of harlotry. Now that is speaking proleptically, meaning you're leaping ahead. He's taking a wife that like Israel, starts off orthodox, turns from her faithfulness and becomes adulterous and has children that don't belong to Hosea. He looks at the kids and they don't look like him. They are children of unfaithfulness, just like Israel. So Hosea is going to feel like God feels. Um, I wonder if I need to bore you on something. Yeah, I'll bore you. There was always a discussion in church history as to whether God was passable, whether he had emotion. Aquinas and those around him said you could only know God by saying what he was not that you could never say what God was like because that would make him analogous to human thought and he was above all human thought and thus you knew God by the via negativa the negative way you didn't know who God was only what he wasn't okay and supposedly it made God non you didn't lower him down to humanity and guys after Aquinas said that's Bologna Ai. Is the, they said, no. They said, whatever is true of God is analogous in man. Man has the privilege of being in the image of God. And thus he can know and feel who God is because God made him like him. And that's right. And so this is God going against the notion of the via negativa. No, God is passable. As a father pities his children, so doth the Lord pity those who fear him. That's why Jesus could tell parables. How you feel is how God feels. Isn't that amazing? That man is the mediator, in a sense, between the infinite God and a physical creation because he is physical, but he has a divine image. Unbelievable. What an accident. And in verse 2, God says, I'm going to make you feel what I feel. You take a wife of harlotry. She's going to abandon her oath and go after God's. And you have children of harlotry. You're going to look at them and they're not yours. So God would look at Israel and they didn't look like him. They looked like the sons of Baal. Christ would say much the same in John 8. They said, uh, whoever commits sin, he said, is a slave of sin. We're children of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anything. Jesus said, uh, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. You're seeking to kill a man who spoke the truth. That Abraham did not do. No, he said, you are not Abraham's children. You are of your father, the devil. Not a popular message. And it got him killed. So he said, no, being a physical Jew doesn't make you a Jew. You've got to spiritually be an Isaac, the true child that God chose and God gave life and God named and God broke him and brought him into obedience. That's a true Jew. And so Hosea, God says, you're going to feel like I feel. You're going to be hurt. Can God use evil things to draw us to a higher place. Isn't that terrible? But he can. He can use pain to raise us up. 
Well, in verse 3, he went and took Gomer. Never marry a woman named Gomer. All right. Just, it's in trouble at the outset. Okay. He got a big mess of trouble. That's why it was called Gomer's Pile. That was a, it was, it was an ancient Jewish belief. All right. <laughs> Where's Charlie Stolfus? Did you check that word out? Ah, oh, heck. Anybody got a computer? A, uh, what you call it? Hey, you got a Hebrew deal on your, on your Bible right there? Somebody find Gomer. Means what? Complete. complete. The word Gomer means complete. You should have known that. Okay. Because it is a complete pile. Uh, it could be that Gomer, like Israel, was complete with God, just as we are. But she took off. Well, who knows? Verse 4, we're going to have three kids, and we're going to name them. Name him Jezreel, which is like naming a kid Branch Davidian. It brings into mind a bad incident. It's like naming a kid Pearl Harbor. Like naming a kid, how would you like to call your kid to supper? Manson. It brings a bad deal to mind. John Dillinger. You don't want to do that. Jezreel was where Jehu, the Hebrews would call him Yehu, God raised up this captain of the northern forces to obliterate Ahab's lineage and to bring a wiping out of that line. God said, I will wipe them like dung. I will wipe them like a dinner plate. Everything, all the scraps are gone. You will, this man will die bleeding his life out in a chariot. And this woman is going to die eaten by the dogs. And he took out all of his lineage. But Yehu went too far. He also killed um, every living person in Israel that followed after Baal. And then he went and destroyed the southern line of the southern king. And so he made sure there was no king anywhere of any lineage in Israel. The amazing thing was, is that God said, because you have been so vociferous in your carrying out of justice... I'm going to give you four kings, four children. Your kid, your grandkid, your great-grandkid, and your great-great-grandkid are going to continue on your lineage. And he let him have a lineage for four generations. The third of those four kings was Jeroboam II. So we're about out of kings. And the line of, of Yehu never repented of the original sin of the first king of the north. You remember Solomon fell into idolatry. God said, I'm going to split the kingdom. Solomon, you'll have your kid down here, Rehoboam, to continue the Davidic line. The northern, he brought in Solomon's uh, industrialist to be the first northern king. His name was Jeroboam the first. And uh, Jeroboam was afraid that the northern kingdom would come down into the south to Jerusalem to worship during the worship period and become loyal to the south, not to him, and forsake their faithfulness and he should have trusted in God. He should have obeyed God. He should have been concerned about being a servant to the people instead of his dynasty. So you remember what he did? He put an idol up in the north in Dan and an idol down in the south in Bethel so that the northern kingdom would never cross the boundary and go to worship according to law in Jerusalem. And he made them worship idols even though he called them God. And forever after that, there are 20 northern kings you know how many were rotten? 20. Not one good northern king. There were like six good southern kings. But there's 20 rotten northern kings. And they got so wicked that God finally wiped them from the face of the earth. And it was always said that with every northern king, he followed after the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. This is a lesson within a lesson. Why would the northern kings go ahead and make idols to the north and idols to the south? Even though they saw the wickedness of idols and what it produced, they wouldn't get rid of those idols. Do you know why? Because they valued their career. 
They felt that religion can go to a certain point, but you can't let it bleed into politics and into your career. So I have to keep the northern kingdom sequestered. Isn't that terrible? He that loses his life will find it. He who finds his life, you lose it. Well, uh, in verse 3, I will punish the house of Yehu, and he did. After Jeroboam's kid, Zechariah, the line will be ended. For the bloodshed of Jezreel, that's where Yehu began his extermination that went too far. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel forever. Yehu, his line, and Israel, his kingdom, because of idolatry, because of his sin. You know, it's interesting that God gave this guy a chance to make an impact in his day. I'm going to take you, Yehu, out of a sinful context. I'm going to give you land, and you're to borrow on what the southern kingdom knows and establish the law of God in the north. And this guy lost the sense of the spiritual inheritance he had, and he went after the economy, politics, war, and wealth. And as a result, lost it all. Can that ever happen to a nation that is taken out of a theistic root and forgets where it came from and now turns to the things of the world until God has to remove it? I'm glad we're above judgment, aren't y'all? As Americans, and we're God's favorite people. Okay. There's a lesson with Yehu for all nations that borrow on the blessings of Israel and then forget where they came from. Well, in verse 5, And I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. No matter how great, because Jeroboam the second brings about great military and uh, geographic increase. Goes all the way back to the original um, lines of the, and boundaries of the land. But is it possible for your economy, politics, and military to fail because spiritually you abandoned the one who brung you? Can that ever happen? And no matter how great all of the aforesaid are, you're a, a guaranteed loser because you have turned from God. And so I'm going to break your bow, and he did. You're going to lose big time on the valley of Jezreel. 724, the Assyrians broke the back of uh, the northern kingdom's uh, military power. And thus, two years later, they were sitting ducks. And so in verse 6, she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said, name her Lo Ruama. Ruama means pity or compassion. The Lo is a negative that means no compassion. So under Jezreel, you will be defeated. Lo Ruama, you will now be destroyed. No more compassion. My patience has ended. You remember that verse do not tempt the Lord your God. What that means is let's see how far we can push him. See, the Bible doesn't teach karma. You know what karma is. Good karma, bad karma is it immediately if you do something, results happen. The Bible doesn't teach karma. It takes time. Because if you saw instant blessing and instant justice, now obedience would be out of a fleshly motive of material gain or a fleshly motive of the loss of material gain, or health, or the like. And God's not going to do that. But whatever you sow, how's it go? You will also reap. It takes time, though. And so God is not karma. Well, lo ruama means, after all of these years, my compassion is ended. Y'all remember it, you, when you were a kid? Go back to Mama's day. When you'd disobey, you'd hear Mama's voice. Kent Leroy Hansen. Wasn't that your middle name? Richard. First you'd say, Kent. You'd keep on going. You know why? 
because you were wicked. <laughs> Kent, don't you make me come in there. But whenever she would pronounce your full legal name, Kent Richard Hansen, you fled for your life. You remember that with your mama? Because I'm coming in there. And so God sent warning shots. He's good. He's gracious. But don't let his mercy confuse you by saying, you thought I was just like you. No, God is just merciful. So we're going to call this next kid. First we say, Jezreel. And everybody remembers destruction. Then you say, Lo Ruama. And here comes your kid. No mercy. I've never dedicated a low Ruama. No mercy. I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. No more patience. Verse 7, I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God, not by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. Do you all remember when the northern kingdom came down, or rather the Assyrians came down on the northern kingdom, and they destroyed it, and then you know where they went? They went on down further south. And the book of Isaiah said they're going to come up to, the, to Jerusalem's neck like a flood. They surrounded Jerusalem like a flood. And a guy named Sennacherib demanded of Hezekiah that he surrender the kingdom to Assyria. And he said no. And he sent a guy named Rabshakeh. And he said to, Sennach, or to Hezekiah, he said, the men in your city are going to eat their dung and drink their urine. I am going to hold you up and you're going to starve to death. And he said, don't think that your God can deliver you. Did any of these other gods deliver them? And Hezekiah took the letter that he sent and he went to Isaiah, his buddy, and he laid it before him. And he said, let's pray. And they went to God and they said, God, children have come to the birth and there's none to deliver we're going to lose mama and kids right here. Jerusalem and all of them. It's out of our hands. Can we ever come to that place in life? This is out of my hands. And God sent a message. And the message was, say this to Rabshakeh, Sennacherib's emissary, against whom have you raised your eyes and haughtily lifted up your voice? Against the Holy One of Israel. And he said, I'm going to take you by the nose and I'm going to lead you back home. And I'm going to lead you a broken man. They woke up the next morning and there was 185,000 dead Assyrians. And they went home in shame. Sennacherib went to have a little quiet time in his temple after that whooping. And his own sons came in and murdered him in the temple of his God. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible <laughs> and God was sending a message you're never safe when you refuse me you're always safe when you trust me and so God would deliver Judah you know why he would deliver Judah because he made a covenant with a Judean king I will never remove my loving kindness from you who was the Judean king David and David was from Judah, to whom God said to Judah, the scepter of Judah will never depart until he comes to whom it belongs, until Shiloh comes. And God said to the antecedent of Judah, Jacob, and to Isaac, and to Abraham, I'm going to give you land, seed, and blessing to all of the earth. And to Abraham, he went back to Shem. Semites, the child of Noah, the child of Seth, to whom God said that the seed of woman will crush the serpent's head. Are we glad God is faithful? It's the Hebrew word hesed, and it means loyalty to your promise. So, five sixths of Israel, you're going into captivity. But this little stump, I'm going to keep you. Even though the north is gone, is the south going to get judged here in a little bit by Babylon? And yet God would say, out of this stump, a root of Jesse will go forth. A suckling. 
You know, the word suckling is the root word for the city, Nazareth. We're going to have a Nazarite that will come forth. And so God in verse 7 is simply good to his promises that he would deliver the south. If the south dies, David dies. If David dies, Christ dies in him. And if Christ dies in him, who now dies? We die. And the world dies. Are we glad that God is faithful to his covenant? Give me a big amen. Amen. Well, in verse 8, she weaned lo Ruama and conceived. That woman still continued in her disobedience and her perseverance in sin. Can humans ever do that? And each child gets worse. Jezreel, there's going to be defeat. Lo Ruama, there's going to be destruction. And now, Lo Ami, there will be disowning. She weaned Lo Ruama, gave birth to a son. They named him Lo Ami. Ami means my people. Lo Ami means not my people. You are not my people, and I am not your God, and they will now be called in history the lost ten tribes of Israel. God will let them go into obscurity, and unless he has saved just a remnant, they would become a Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. We're glad a few of them came back. You know why? Because some of them that came back were from Naphtali, the tribe. And from Naphtali, we will get Peter, Andrew, James, John, Nathaniel, Matthew, Jude, Thaddeus, Ju uh, Simon the Canaanite or the Zealot. We're going to get all a bunch of northern guys that are going to come back. Whew. Only one is going to be from the south. Who's that? Judas. Yeah. And so God is good. And so, defeat, destruction, and disowning. That is the Mosaic law. Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. I swear to you, you obey me and the rains will come. Your enemies will be defeated. And the Mosaic law was the way that Israel could now enjoy their unconditional covenant relationship to God. It's like when you have a son and you say, you are always my son. I love you because I gave life to you. But do sons always enjoy that relationship? They don't because they don't follow the rules. The rules don't make you a son, but the rules let you enjoy the relationship to a son. You get married, you make a vow. Does that mean that your marriage will be good? You have to keep the rules to enjoy the covenant. But ideally, though your mate messes up, you don't necessarily pun him. Well, God gave Israel a covenant by which they were his. The Mosaic covenant lets them enjoy the God of the promises. But even though they sin, even though that son may take the father's wealth and go to a foreign country and blow it and end up envying the pigs when he goes home the father says this son of mine was lost and now he's found are we glad we are well in verse 10 through chapter 2 verse 1 here is the hope of Israel watch how verse 10 begins what's the first word in verse 10 yet or but or however a guy named James Montgomery Boyce one time preached a very famous series called But God. All the times in the Bible. And Joseph said, remember me for I've been in slavery unjustly this long. But he no longer remembered Joseph and he stayed in captivity in prison two more full years. But God... We once were disobedient ourselves, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, but God, 
being rich in mercy. There's always a but God. Verse 10, but the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. That remind you of a verse? Where in the Bible do you see God saying to a man, I'm going to give you a great seed and it'll be like the sand of the sea and like the stars of the heavens. Who's the man? Abraham. God calls into mind the Abrahamic covenant. I made a promise to a man and I will never forsake you. And so someday Israel that has been scattered, Israel that there is no compassion, Israel, that you're not my people, someday you're going to be like the sand of the sea. Even though you're Jezreel right now and dispersed, someday in this land, it's going to be like Zechariah says, noisy with men because God is faithful. So there's your Abrahamic covenant. And in the place where it said to them, Lo Ami, you're not my people, you'll be called sons of the living God. I'm going to deliver you out of judgment and into blessing. Now, this is another covenant. You remember in the book of Jeremiah, God says, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel someday. And I'll put my law in their hearts and on their minds, I will write it. And I will be your God and you will be my people. It's called the New Testament or the New Covenant. I'm going to put the law in your heart. There's going to be a rebirth. There's going to be a regeneration. I'm going to make you my child. And so God remembers the Abrahamic covenant. God remembers the new covenant. And you know what's amazing, Kent? The new covenant hadn't been given yet by Hosea. It comes later under Jeremiah. God anticipates Someday I'm going to make you once again my children. It's called the rebirth. It's called being born again of the water and the spirit. Washed and made new. And in verse 11, And the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together. The scattered north and the scattered south under Babylon. Someday I'm going to bring you back into a nation. Now, if you know your Old Testament, this is called the Palestinian Covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 30. You remember the first generation got destroyed in the wilderness journey? Y'all seen the movie? All right. That first generation died in the wilderness. Everybody over 20. The new generation raised up. God called them before him. And he said, before we go into the land of Canaan, I want you to know something, and it's called Deuteronomy, the second law to the new generation, the duet nomos. And God said, here's a reiteration of the law, and then in chapter 30, he said, you're not going to keep it. And there's going to be a day that you're going to be judged and you're going to be removed from the land. Came 800 years after Moses. Then you know what God said? It's called the Palestinian covenant. I'm going to give you the land. He said, wherever you're scattered, when you remember God and you repent, I will regather you to the land, all of you, and I will make you a great nation and I'll circumcise your hearts to obey and I'll remove your enemies. That will occur in the kingdom someday under Messiah. And so once again, though you are no compassion, though you are scattered, someday the Palestinian covenant, Deuteronomy 30, I'm going to bring you together. Even though you're not my people, the new covenant, I'm going to make you my people. Even though you're out of the land, someday you'll be like the sand of the sea. So is Israel a violator of Moses? Yes, they are. But God never forgets who they are. See, this is why I believe deeply in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Literally, literally, to the nation of Israel, and that the kingdom promises are literal. The reason I hold to this is I hold to the Hesed of God, 
the loving kindness of God to his covenant people, like Homer is to Gomer. Not Homer, Hosea. I just checked y'all to see how stupid you were. And I'm very disappointed. <laughs> Not Homer and Gomer. <laughs> Lawana, you knew that. Don't test me. Hosea and Gomer, I'm going to someday bring you back to me. And in verse 11, and they will appoint for themselves one leader. You're not going to have a northern king and a southern king. You're going to be the sand of the sea. You're going to be in a new covenant. You're going to be regathered north and south, and you will choose one leader. Question, who will the leader be that Israel will repent beneath and be reborn? It is Messiah. We have a covenant on that. God took a guy named Saul and he removed him, and he took a little fellow that was a shepherd, and he said, someday I'm going to build you a great house, and your descendants will always have a king on the throne. And God made a covenant with that king. What's the king's name? David. It's called the Davidic covenant. How many covenants have we seen here? Abraham, where God promised now stay with me right here. In the Abrahamic covenant, God promised, Abraham, go to the land that I've called you to, and I'll make you a great seed, a great nation, and in you the, earth, the nations of the earth will be blessed. Land, seed, and spiritual blessing to the whole earth. Those are the three limbs of the trunk of God's promises to Israel. The Abrahamic covenant, I will give you land, I'll fill it with a people, seed, and you will be a blessing to the entire earth. In your seed shall the nations be blessed. You and I are the nations, the Gentiles. Do we happen to be blessed by a particular Jew? Yes, we do, by Jesus Christ. And so the eight, when I was in seminary, I had a professor named Tom Constable. Charlie? Where are you? Did you ever have Tom Constable? He taught um, Old Testament. And I remember him taking, this was in the day when we had blackboards. We had chalk. Chalk. And he drew up a tree trunk. And he put Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3. Land, seed, blessing. He said that's the trunk of the fig tree, as it were. And then he drew a big branch out this way, and he wrote on it, land. He drew another big branch this way. He wrote seed. He drew a branch this way. He put blessing. He said the other three one-way covenants of God that don't depend on the nation but on his faithfulness, they all come out of the land, seed, and blessing of the trunk of Abraham. And he said the land promise is called the Palestinian covenant. I will regather you to the land. The seed is called the Davidic covenant. There will be a king to rule over the nation of Israel. And men will beat their swords and plowshares, spears and their pruning hooks, study war no more. And then there is a limb that is called blessing. The nation shall be blessed. And he said that is the new covenant of the Holy Spirit's rebirth of the child of God. And he said, you've got land, seed, and blessing, land, seed, blessing, Palestinian, Davidic, new covenant. He said, that is the great tree of your Bible. And that's exactly what Hosea speaks to. So someday the mosaic is going to cast you into despair. But it is God's mercy that he promised Abraham that Abraham's seed will come to save man, to regather Israel, and to place them in the land. So what are all of the promises of God dependent upon? Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Even the Mosaic. What's the penalty of sin? The wage of sin is Christ would die. 
What is the prophecy of the law? Moses said, someday a redeemer will come just like me that'll take his stand between God and men. Is there a fellow in the Bible that's the mediator between God and men? It is Jesus. The prophecy of the law is Jesus. The penalty of the law is Jesus. What is the picture of the law? You don't come to God on your own. A priest comes with the shedding of blood, and by faith in him, you are saved. The picture of the law is Jesus. What's the purpose of the law? To show you your sin, to drive you to our high priest, Jesus. All of the covenants are fulfilled in him. You know what I'd say? I'd say as many as are the promises of God, in him they are yes. Well, chapter 2, verse 1 should be chapter 1, verse 12, but nobody asked me. But he will now turn and say to his brothers, Lo Ami, no, Ami. And to your sisters, Lo Ruama, no, Ruama. Incidentally, would you notice that men and women are put on the same level here? Because in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor freeman, Male and female, they're one in Christ Jesus. Different roles, different order, different purpose, same love. That's why you see Jesus with Peter, James, and John, and the Marys, and all the rest, all the other women. And so, God someday, now at the end of verse 11, here's what this means. They will appoint one leader. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, don't call yourself father, there's but one father. Don't call yourself leader, there's but one leader, Messiah. They will go up from the land. You know what that means? Go up has the idea of crops going up like life in blessing. The reason you take that view is that the last line of verse 11 says, Great will be the day of Jezreel. It's a play on words. All of the bad things at the first are now made good things. Jezreel, you remember in the first of the chapter, means to scatter because God would scatter them in judgment. You know what else the word Jezreel can mean? To sow. S-O-W. To scatter. To bring life. And so, no, you're not going to be scattered in judgment. You will go up from the land And great will be the day of God's scattering. Isn't that great? Israel's going to be like life. little sermon in a sermon. I'm going to go over because it's such bad weather. You've got nothing to do at home. And when you walk outside, you're going to get swept away. So just listen, okay? Uh, What was I talking about? Jezreel. Oh, yeah. Often in your Bible, it will speak of rain. Do y'all remember last year when you couldn't get spit right now? It was so dry. And what did you all pray? Be honest. What did you pray? God send us rain. Has God got the lakes back? Let's have a hand for God, could we? Thank you. Are, is, are our lakes back? Anybody know? Are there really? Okay. So God has brought us back. Zachariah says, ask God for the spring rain, not the bales, and God did it. Well, often the idea of God's rain coming down is an anticipation of his greater blessing, of spiritual blessing. If you can trust God for the rain, you can trust God for redemption, okay? And so the fact that God has given us rain means that God can give even greater things, amen? Let's pray, see. They're the supreme court. They ain't the supreme being. So God can give his blessing. And so, someday, Kent, there's going to be bounty in the land because God scatters and he gives blessing. And your brothers, they're going to be Ami and Ruwama. Everything is going to be overturned. Let me ask you, can God do this? Can God take a complete obliteration, annihilation, and wreck and say, rise, take up your pallet, and go home. He can do that. He can deliver us from the domain of darkness, and he can bring us into the kingdom of his dear son.
I'm glad. Father in heaven, thank you that where the law condemned us and the law indicted us and the law brought us down to our knees where we had been unfaithful to you and we had been defeated and destroyed and disowned that through the mercy of Jesus Christ not merely Israel will have new life someday as an entire nation but we as the church right now can be grafted into the rich root of Israel which is Messiah that in his seed shall the nations be blessed. And so I pray for any boy, girl, man, or woman out there that has made a spiritual, theological, moral, domestic, financial mess of their lives and is now envying the pigs' pods. If I could just have it as good as the pigs, I'd be better off. And he said, I'm going home. And he went back home to his father. And you ran to meet him. And you put the ring on his finger. You put the sandals on his feet and the, the robe upon his back. You put the garland upon his head. And you said, this son of mine was lost. And he's home. And they began to be merry. Bless us as we look at this Ah Me prophet. Amen.